Do we always need to be 100% true to a composer's original intentions when we play something? If you listen to different interpretations by even top-class musicians, then you'll hear that not everybody would say that this is definitely the case. And I think there's certainly a lot of room for interpretation. Let me explain why. Welcome to Tommy's Piano Corner. I'm Tommy. This is the place for returning pianists, or indeed anybody who loves piano, to share tips and ideas of how to get the best from this great hobby. If it's your first trip here, then please do remember to subscribe, simply hit the little icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen now, and it's all done for you. As classical pianists, much of what we play has most definitely stood the test of time. Bach left us in 1750, Mozart in 1791, Chopin in 1849, and Rachmaninoff more recently in 1943. Yet, despite some of this music being several hundred years old, there are albums released constantly where new pianists put their own mark on this beautiful music. Now surely this has got to mean there's an awful lot of scope for interpretation in all of this beautiful music. Otherwise, let's be honest, every recording of these pieces would sound exactly the same as everybody would be interpreting exactly what they think the composer wanted. Different pianists have taken very different approaches over the years. Perhaps the greatest purist of which I'm aware is Richter, who believed that you need to interpret to the letter. And here's a quote from him. The interpreter is really an executant, carrying out the composer's intentions to the letter. He doesn't add anything that isn't already in the work. If he is talented, he allows us to glimpse the truth of the work that is in itself a thing of genius, and that is reflected in him. He shouldn't dominate the music, but should dissolve into it. Horowitz, on the other hand, takes a slightly different view of the world, and here's what he has to say. The score is not a Bible, and I'm never afraid to dare. The music is behind those dots. Remaining with Horowitz, there's even a very famous documentary of him recording Mozart, where he actually tells the conductor that he's going to change a note in the piece because he finds it better. Now there is a brave man. There are, of course, other areas of contention, such as the use of the pedal. You'll come across a debate, I'm sure, where there are some that say you should never, ever use pedal in bark because at the time that music was written, the sustain pedal didn't exist. Yeah, Andrew Schiff, if you watch his recording of the entire Well-Tempered Clavier Book 1, you'll see that he makes, albeit sparing, but still makes use of the sustain pedal every now and then when he believes it's going to add something to the music. Now, of course, this doesn't mean you can simply do whatever you like with a piece of music. To quote Horowitz again, he said it's very important to study a composer and to study as much of the music as that composer has written as possible. And in that way, even when you play a short piece by Brahms or Chopin, you're able to play it with a lot more understanding. However, a marking of Andante is not a strict metronome timing. When something says Piumoso, how much faster does that mean you're supposed to go? When it says tempo rubato, is that the only time that it's permissible to use rubato in a piece? Now clearly there are lots of guidelines available and maybe some would go as far as to say rules about what's permissible and what isn't. But the simple fact is that there's an awful lot of latitude available within these markings that are given to us. I also read somewhere that Chopin never liked his students to try and copy the way he played his music. In fact, he would go as far as to play something very differently when he felt that a student was trying to just do a carbon copy of the way he'd interpreted a piece previously. So clearly, Chopin fully expected that anybody playing his music would be trying to interpret that music and not just copy it note for note. 
I think it's a little like the difference between translation and interpretation when you talk about foreign languages. When you translate something, this is something that's done more word for word, it's done painstakingly, it's done extremely slowly, there's a lot of time taken over it. However, when something's interpreted, that means that basically more often than not it's done in the moment and it's somebody doing their best to convey the full depth of the message that's being spoken in the foreign language in a different language. So I would say that in your practice room, you're going through a process of translation where you're taking every note from the score, you're translating that into the keys on the piano and into the movements that you make to play it. However, when you come to play the piece, that's when you interpret it. And I think that's a little of what Horowitz meant when he said that you should never be afraid to dare. Therefore, on balance, I think it makes a lot of sense to study a piece of music as much as you can when you approach it. You know, study other things by that composer, not only their piano works, but other works that they've written. Get a real feel for the way they approach music, for how it sounds. Also, given that it's so easy to get things on YouTube, listen to some recordings by good pianists, and then listen to some recordings by not so good pianists. And that way you can start to pick out what sounds good, what sounds bad, and apply this more easily to your own playing. However, do be careful that you keep an open mind when you're listening to the views of respected professors, so to speak. We all have a tendency to subconsciously ignore things that don't reinforce what we already think, so it's good to keep an open mind and consider more than one thing at a time. Taking the example of whether or not you should be using pedaling bark, try to understand the viewpoint of people who say you shouldn't, why they have that viewpoint, and see the sense in it. Then also think about the viewpoint of those who say that you can use pedaling bark, and try to understand why they say it, why do they have this view, and then compare the two with an open mind and make your own mind up about it. And of course, always remember that there will be differences of opinion. I think probably the most publicised one between two major musicians was between Glenn Gould and Bernstein back in 1962, where Bernstein gave a speech before a concert, basically saying he didn't like the way Glenn Gould was going to play it, but that he'd go along with it anyway. Of course, we don't all have the great skill of Glenn Gould, so we shouldn't be perhaps going to too many extremes when we interpret a piece of music. However, if you prefer, for example, playing Bach C-sharp major prelude more in the way that Lang Lang plays it, rather than in the way that Andrew Schiff plays it, then why not? Now clearly, I think perhaps everybody would agree that Andrew Schiff is probably the most authoritative interpreter of Bach that's around at the moment, but if you prefer a little more pedal and a little more dynamics in the way Lang Lang does it, then why not? Similarly, if you like playing Debussy's Claire de Lune and you like to take that middle section somewhat faster than, say, Richter would play it, then why shouldn't you take it faster? You need to be able to go with your feelings. So if you're not already, then please do remember to subscribe to Tommy's Piano Corner. Click on that little bell icon so that you're notified of new videos as and when they're released. I thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week.